What's going on guys? Welcome back to another movie recap and review. Today we're going to be looking at The Green Inferno, a movie about a group of student activists who plan a trip to the Amazon to stop a company from destroying the local jungle and killing off the ancient native tribes. The movie begins in a forest setting, where a tribal duo of an older man and child are gathering fruits. They suddenly see a machine smashing down trees and are struck with fear and surprise. On the other side, we see a group of student activists protesting for health insurance of janitors. They are on a hunger strike and state that they will not eat until their demands are met. Justine is interested in the cause, but her roommate Casey despises the activists because they disturbed her sleep on a Sunday morning. Justine also follows the hunger strike, but does not admit that she had done so to support the student activists. On returning from a cafe, they both stop by the lawn where the protest is taking place. Casey tries to tease the protesters with food and says that they have to starve to death for waking her up on a Sunday morning. Sheesh, I'm glad I didn't wake her up on a Sunday morning. Justine notices Alejandro playing the guitar for his group. Casey warns her that the guy is creepy, and Justine admits that she finds him charismatic. Alejandro's girlfriend Kara kisses him to let the bystander know that he is already taken. In a lecture, Justine and Casey learn about the female circumcision, also known as female genital mutilation. The professor tells them that about two million girls go through the process every year. She shows them the kind of blade used for the operation, and images of girls going through it. The entire class is highly disturbed by the visual and facts related to female circumcision. Casey asks why the process is done, and the professor tells her that until the young girls go through this, they're not considered women. On learning that people think of this brutality as a rite of passage, Justine interrupts and suggests to her professor that they must contact the ambassador on the East 44th Street to do something about it. She also says that her father is a lawyer of the UN, and maybe he could get involved and look for a solution. Her professor tells her that the practice is prevalent not just in Africa, but also in Middle Eastern and Muslim countries. She says, to stop the issue, they would need every lawyer in the UN. Justine gets out of class and tells Casey that instead of having lessons about safe sex, they should teach each other about global issues. They're interrupted by a fellow student of the same class, who asks Justine to talk to him for a moment. He hands her a flyer for the group called Activist Change Team, The Act. She tells him it's a great thing, but she's not into such stuff. She tells her that Alejandro asked him to give it to her. He also talks about how the environment of the group is pretty chill. They talk about stuff and have great food. Alright, that's a good enough reason, I guess. Justine interjects him by asking about the hunger strikes, and Jonah informs her that it's optional. He also gives her information about the celebration they organized that day, because the school finally agreed to provide health insurance to the janitors. Justine is impressed, and she responds that she'll think about joining the group. He leaves saying that she must not think about it, but rather act on it. Get it? Act on it? Hey, it's not my joke, okay? It's Alejandro's. Casey makes fun of him and asks Justine whether she thinks about going to the celebration. Justine laughs along and says that she's acting like she's thinking about it. Later, Justine visits her dad and discusses the issue of female genital mutilation. He responds that everyone is aware of such problems and the UN Environment Program handles them. He tells her that it's an issue that cannot be cured overnight. She says that if it were something concerning oil, then this practice of FGM would come to an end instantly. Her father informs her that they have to go through numerous procedures to initiate change. They cannot simply invade another country because they do something that others think is illegal or abnormal. Alejandro asks the group if they've ever had fantasies of saving a dying tribe and protecting them from encroaching civilization. He tells them that there is an opportunity for her to turn their dream into reality. He informs them that in the upcoming two weeks, the untouched jungle of the Peruvian Amazon will be destroyed, along with the natives who live inside. A company wanted the natural gas present in the ground under the villages. They're planning to GPS the location, bulldoze the homes of the natives, and kill them off. The tribes living there are ancient and have only been seen through rare satellite photos. Justine asks them about their plan of action, and if they're thinking of marching to the jungle and starving themselves. Alejandro asks if she's a freshman because only newcomers speak with such disrespect. He asks her to leave the meeting and ignores her apology. Justine leaves, and Jonah follows. He tells her that Alejandro is very serious about his social work and apologizes for his behavior. The next day, Justine finds Alejandro and apologizes to him again. Alejandro tells her that his group needs people who are serious about trying to make an impact. She tells him that she is serious and she would love to get a chance to learn. He asks her about a cause that's important important to her personally and keeps her up at night. She says that it's women's rights in Africa. He then asks her how a suburban white girl can go to a village in Africa and state that FGM is wrong. She tells him that she's thinking about the same, and he informs her that the best way would be to organize a group, go to that village, and get media attention. The threat of embarrassment is what drives a change. She asks for a chance to prove herself and attends the next group meeting. They strategize their plan against the company based in Peru, which is hell-bent on destroying the village and killing the villagers with the help of ex-army men. They decide to livestream the destruction from 
different locations of the village, using a satellite so that the Peruvian government can't notice them. Kara stops Justine after the meeting and questions her intentions to join the group. She alarms Justine that the jungle is a dangerous place and she should be careful. Justine meets Casey and tells her about the rally. Casey is skeptical about the decision and says that they will shoot Justine and burn her body. If the workers see them messing with their development, they might turn violent. She asks her dad about her decision. Justine lies to her father, saying that it's a school trip and nothing will be dangerous. He tells her that Peru is a dangerous country and he sends her the contact info of the US ambassador appointed there. She then leaves for Peru that day. Alright, well, what do you guys think so far about this upcoming trip to the Peruvian rainforest? Anyone else want to go? No? Okay. The group reaches Peru, and they meet Carlos, who is an activist and a pilot. Jonah tries to sit next to Justine on the plane, but is unable to fit. His friend teases him and says that nothing can happen between him and Justine. Jonah says that they are friends, and he has no such thoughts. Yeah, right. Carlos is funding the group and thanks the students for getting global attention to the issue. They reach a restaurant, and Daniel installs the streaming apps on all their phones. Alejandro tells them what to expect. They must constantly be streaming since the cameras are their only defense. Another activist asks if the company will be using guns against them, and Kara answers that they had already talked about them. Everyone gets paranoid and Alejandro reiterates that their phones will act as their guns against the actual guns of the company people. The next day, they get to the docks and frantically rush towards the boats. On their way, they're reminded to conserve their mobile batteries. Justine and Lars request the ships to be stopped at a location where they could use a washroom. The driver gives them both a gun and a knife to guard against snakes. While Justine reaches the back safe, Lars fires gunshots and runs back to the boat, telling everyone that a tarantula crawled on his, uh, you know what. On their way, they see beautiful sceneries and a jaguar. Nice! They finally reach the jungle, dress up as constructors, and remove accessories and extra gear. They carry their passports as identity proof in case they get arrested. They reach a location with a bulldozer and construction workers. Carlos bids them goodbye, and Alejandro distributes face masks to each of them. He says that everyone has one face, and that they're there for a cause and to make history. They wear masks, and each member chains themselves to a different spot, like a bulldozer or a tree. They begin the streaming and get noticed by the ex-military men who approach them with machine guns. Oh boy. Justine's lock does not work, and a military man snatches her phone and shoots it. He unchains her and points a gun at her. While Justine pleads Alejandro to help her, Alejandro asks everyone to continue streaming. The man threatens them that if they do not stop, he will kill her. Alejandro informs the viewers that this corporation are destroying the Peruvian tribes and shooting a girl whose father is a lawyer at the United Nations. The man gets a call, and he instructs all his men to put down their weapons. Everyone is arrested and brought back to Carlos's plane. They celebrate their victory while Justine is traumatized. And why wouldn't she be? She almost got shot. Their streams and tweets go viral, and the construction company is charged for illegal exploitation of the jungle. Alejandro tells Justine that she's a hero, but she confronts him about putting her in danger. He retaliates, saying that she was already aware of the risks. He said that she had earlier begged him to give her a chance, and he had created that role for her. She realizes that it was all planned, and she should have never accompanied them. Wow, what the heck? This guy basically gave her a faulty lock so that they could start this whole show? Well, it worked. Can we go home now? Just then, the front wings of the plane suddenly break down, and it crashes. Carlos and the pilot die. Some of the group members are sucked out of the aircraft while others sustain injuries. After they crash and wake up, Kara sees someone approaching. She calls out to them for help and arrows are shot at group members. Most of them die, while others are shot with darts to make them unconscious. She wakes up on a boat with tribals. All the other members are also being carried on similar ships, and many tribals are painted in red. They gather near the riverbank to see them. The crowd takes them to the village, where they're kept in cages along with animals. The head of the tribe removes Jonah's eyes and tongue and then eat them raw. R.I.P. Jonah. They cut his body parts, remove his neck, and drink his blood. The village celebrates the sight while the entire group is horrified and scared. The tribal cooks Jonah's body parts and have a feast. Alejandro tells the group that the villagers think of them as their enemies. Justine says that they must have hope and someone might be looking for them. Lars tells her that no one is looking for them and their best chance of survival is to find the GPS signal before their phone batteries die. Alejandro suggests that they might reach the bulldozers and use them against the natives. He tells everyone that they haven't stopped anything but had just delayed it for a few days. He reveals that it was all a PR stunt and another company hired Carlos to halt the active construction unit before they reached there. The entire rally was organized so that Carlos could get paid and that ACT would gain worldwide recognition. Everyone is shocked while Alejandro further says that the second company might have reached the location and started from where the previous one left the work. Justine is enraged and blames him for risking everyone's life. Alejandro justifies himself by saying that's how the real world works. There's even the possibility that the plane was sabotaged to kill Carlos. He informs them that the bulldozers might take three days to get there. The village will feed on Jonah for a week. Until then, they can stay calm and try not to upset the villagers. Dude, try and stay calm? Are you kidding me? But then again, what other choice do they have? 
The following day, the girls are separated from the boys. The head of the group uses a sharp object to create a cut in her, uh, personal spot and marks Justine's forehead with blood. She's taken away by the villagers while Samantha tells the group that she has seen a boat and can look for help. Others distract the guard while Samantha sneaks out and reaches the boat. Justine is returned to the cage and her body is painted white with red dots. She does not remember what happened to her. Justine plays the little flute from her pendant when the children bring them food. Alejandro says they were pork scraps when Amy notices Samantha's tattoo and realizes they killed and cooked her. She instantly breaks the vessel and uses it to slit her throat. Lars adds his bag of weed to Amy's throat so that the villagers will get high when they cook her. The weed works and Justine and Daniel climb out of the cage. Alejandro uses the dart to prevent Lars from escaping because he does not wish to be left alone and get cooked. Lars regains consciousness and Alejandro tells him that he was darted by the tribals and Justine and Daniel are dead too. The tribals then bite and eat Lars alive while he tries to escape. R.I.P. Lars. Justine and Daniel reach the crash site. They find the corpse of their friend hung on sticks. They try to find a phone when the tribals catch them and take them back to the village. They tie Daniel to a pole and leave ants on him while Justine is again covered in a white powder. The head of the tribe is about to use the blade on Justine's personal part when a boy brings the head of a construction worker. The entire village follows him. Justine frees herself with the help of a kid and heads to save Daniel. Daniel pleads with her to kill him. While she continues to free him, the young boy slits Daniel's throat. Justine leaves Alejandro behind and gives the pendant to the kid as a parting gift. She hears gunshots and sees an army shooting down the villagers. She gets rescued with the help of armed men who had previously held her at gunpoint. When they ask her if anyone is left to be rescued, she says that there was no one. Justine makes it back to America and sits with her father and other officials for an investigation. She tells everyone that the entire group had died in the plane crash. She lies that the natives had found her and kept her safe and alive. She also says she didn't feel any fear around them until the bulldozers came and slaughtered them. The detective asks her about the perception of the tribe being cannibals and manhunters. Justine denies having witnessed any such instance. She wakes up to a nightmare where she bites Alejandro. She hears a student protest on another issue happening at the same spot where ACT used to protest. The movie closes with Alejandro's sister calling Justine, where she had found a satellite photo of her brother and she wants to talk to her about it and that is the end of the movie guys what did you think about the green inferno let me know your thoughts down below in the comments i thought this film was extremely just horrific and on the edge of your seat type of story every minute of the movie i think it's definitely one of those movies that you're gonna think about even after you're done watching it I think they did a great job on the overall story and the perspective of the natives and the horror elements involved and, you know, what possibly could be going on and these ancient tribes in the middle of nowhere that have not been touched by human civilization. It's all just, you know, fascinating. It, it's, it's scary, but it's fascinating. And, you know, it just leaves everything up to interpretation because there might actually be places like this. Anyways, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, hit that sub button if you're new because I upload videos every day. And until next time, I'll see you guys in the next one.